If we take a look at the emergence of ancient civilizations, one of the oldest civilizations is derived in the Middle East. Again, there are some key locations geographically on Earth where we find some of these ancient civilizations emerging. Middle East is not the only one, but is one of the older places on Earth where human beings settle down and develop strong urban communities. Particularly in the part of the Fertile Crescent called the Mesopotamian area, between the Tigris and Euphrates River, we find the earliest population to succeed and leave a legacy is that of what's now identified as Sumeria. There's some very active research today into trying to figure out who these people were and where their even ancestors, um, or even their ancestors, came from because they're quite sort of mysterious as to where they originally came from. The Babylonians also have a strong legacy in this area in Mesopotamia that we still research and learn about today. And so the first group we'll talk about in this portion of our presentation is ancient Sumerian medicine. Our ancient ancestors, roughly 4000 BCE, documented, and these are some of the earliest written documents, going to, to about 4000 to 3000 BCE, clearly recognized that some individuals got sick and recovered, which is part of what we call active natural immunity. You get sick, and then you get well, because your own immune system has provided some sort of protection or cure or return to health for you. But it still was recognized or clearly identified in ancient times that there was some kind of invisible force. There was something unseen both making you ill and then getting you well. we take a look in that area that we call Mesopotamia, the ideal conditions for establishing domesticated plants and animals, as well as urban areas for occupation and unique interactions between people and cooperation amongst folks and people living in this part of the world to establish and promote and continue these interactions and these activities um, ideally was suited in this part of the world, in the Middle East, the part that we call the Fertile Crescent. You can see that parts of the Fertile Crescent include what we think of today as modern Egypt, Israel, Syria, Iraq, and even parts of Iran. We take a look at where Sumer, the kingdom of Sumer, which was essentially started to be established as a well-recognized empire um, or kingdom and in roughly 3200 BC, it's not a very large area, but certainly has given us quite a legacy of information because the Sumerians gave us many firsts in terms of human communication as well as medicine. The cultivation of grains and establishing those permanent residences that we think of as villages, towns, and cities often associated with certain types of foods. Or there are scientists who, and archaeologists who firmly are convinced that one of the reasons human beings settled down was because they realized the importance of certain types of grasses and the grains produced by those grasses that could then be used to make certain types of food, like bread or beer. Barley in particular, or an ancient wild barley, uh, found in the areas of the Fertile Crescents, 
certainly is the foundation for the beverage that we identify today as beer. And that was being cultivated, or human beings started cultivating it roughly um, 10,000 years ago, or around 8,000 BCE. Now, the little photo on the left is a relief or an image produced in Sumeria um, using what's described as a little stone uh, cylinder. And you can clearly see the individuals on the bottom of this two rows of people doing some kind of activity. One person definitely is drinking something and the other person standing next to them has what looks very much like a pitcher or a teapot. Right above we have two individuals seated next to some kind of pot with some long what appear to be straws coming from the pot. Well what could that possibly be? We can find the equivalent even today illustrated by the photo in the top right why folks who are sharing a common jug of rice wine and they're using long straws to sip this rice wine from this communal pot. Historians, archaeologists, and scientists today interpret that same activity occurring in this image from ancient Sumeria that the individuals in the top row who are drinking something with a straw are very much probably drinking beer or some kind of alcoholic beverage because we do find in some of the documents and information left to us from the Sumerians are little clay tablets which is how they wrote and recorded their information on baked clay tablets and there were several recipes for beer or some kind of aspect of beer in their daily life. This is in the lower right a little clay tablet that has the receipt for the best beer um, to be delivered to so it's kind of a receipt it's a document that says you're gonna have the best beer delivered or you're going to be receiving the best beer roughly 2000 BCE in the ancient kingdom of war of Sumeria which came first beer or bread mm, oftentimes some folks really think that it was beer first and it was the harvesting of grains, first wild grains, and then eventually creating or helping to domesticate those grains into even more productive um, grasses, that the beer itself was the catalyst for establishing those mechanisms or methods of agriculture. And then the beer was another um, base material or sort of foundation for the formation and the making of bread. Whether it's bread or beer, because you can also take pieces of bread dough and use those to make beer. Um, how much overlap and which came first, kind of like a chicken or egg, it's really hard to say at this point. Though they scientists have done scrapings from different vessels or pots from ancient times and definitely found remnants of beer-like substances in those containers from thousands of years ago. So beer can be used to make bread and bread can be used to make beer. The little clay tablet photo on this slide is a note or comment about a daily ration of barley beer for workers. Um, it's estimated that this little clay tablet is about 5,000 years old and was written at around 3100 to 3000 BCE. There are different companies that have tried to essentially reformulate 
or recreate these ancient beers. After the analysis of the scrapings of the material from the different containers, especially what kind of uh, grains and what kinds of, sh of sugars or honey um, were used in creating those different beverages, then certain microbrewing companies, and these are ideal companies for trying to reformulate these ancient beverages, have in fact been somewhat successful at creating facsimiles of what the ancient Sumerians might have been drinking. Dogfish Brewing was one of the earlier microbrewers who recreated a Sumerian beer called Midas Touch. In fact, they've recreated several facsimiles of ancient alcoholic beverages. The Sumerians were in fact the first people to develop the written language. That's one of the legacies that we take for granted. Um, that a person could take a writing implement and with symbols, use of symbols, convey some kind of information. And it's the Sumerians who gave us that initial legacy. They used clay tablets, thankfully, um, because the clay tablets were then baked or dried, and what was left were impressions on the clay, and the clay itself was usually rock hard. So a very sturdy resource to last through the thousands of years it took for us to find them and then learn how to interpret them. You can see in the upper left hand corner this clay tablet with the ancient Sumerian writing that's called the cuneiform writing, um, that some of the symbols on this little cuneiform tablet look just like a, a head of wheat or barley. Looks like a little sort of Christmas tree upside down. We can even see in this table that indicates the symbol and on the far right what the symbol stood for, you can clearly see the symbol for grain on the little clay tablet. So the, that, that information, that visual image, as well as in this case it's probably again a receipt or some kind of business document about the transfer of grain, um, can at a glance tell someone just exactly what the transaction was that was being recorded and transmitted to other people. Sumerian medicine is some of the oldest medical literature that we have available. Um, the oldest medical text that's Sumerian in origin from the Ur-3 period, roughly 2400 BCE. Again, on a clay tablet using cuneiform writing, um, with different types of treatments and incantations to get a person well. This is a period in time during human development that medicine was more of a mystical and magical approach to treatment than a more pragmatic or practical approach because people just didn't know and they didn't have the technical resources. Sumerian medicine reached its golden age at roughly 1400 BCE through around 1000 BCE. It's during this time that different medical tablets or books were collected and kept. And there's a series of roughly 40 tablets that are used together that constitutes what we think of as the Sumerian medical textbook of the time. It did include diagnosis and prognosis, which eventually has become a standard tool in medical arts even today. And the book included descriptions of diagnostic conditions and prognosis and treatments um, essentially from head to toe. It was a very comprehensive sort of information 
that anyone could use who was given the, the training as a physician priest at the time to care for the sick, especially, as well as possibly the injured. Physicians often recommended the use of minerals and common sources of, of what we think of as um, purgatives or treatments that could relieve pain, such as even table salt. Sodium chloride or table salt has been used for millennia um, for various kinds of therapies or treatments not very popular today, but one of the treatments for a sore throat that your grandmother or great-grandmother probably used was salt water. It's not very often recommended or even suggested nowadays, but using salt and salt water um, for relieving throat pain, cleaning a wound, um, that was something that was used by these ancient physicians in Sumeria roughly 5,000 years ago. Potassium nitrate, or saltpeter, also has some anti-inflammatory processes or properties. And so many of the recommendations or treatments that Sumerian physicians used did rely on preparations that included salt and saltpeter. The document that's imaged on the right, there's two versions of the same document, or clay tablet, is in fact the facsimile of that most ancient or oldest Sumerian medical book. Not very comprehensive or big, but it is a beginning. Sumerian physicians were well respected and well recognized in their field and in their within their kingdom. They would have calling cards in the form of stone cylinders that had etched little images on the little stone cylinder that can then be rolled in some wet clay and the image transferred from the stone cylinder to the clay. Here is an example of the business card, if you will, of an ancient Sumerian physician. In fact, the collection of these ancient Sumerian physician seals, the little stone cylinders, um, has been a popular um, pastime or hobby, if you will, of some individuals that do collecting. Here we have in this image on this physician seal the image of the physician himself and the reason we have two of them is that they just kept, kept rolling the seal um, so you can see the same little image on both ends of this photo and in the middle there's an incantation and cuneiform uh, images as well as some of the tools that the physician might use like um, incense burners or plant materials um, for the treatment and care of the patient. Along with this illustration, the, <coughs> the text itself suggests a prayer to a specific god who was essentially in charge of obstetrics and gynecology, who attended animals when they dropped their young. And this physician was aligning himself with that kind of medical care of essentially mothers and offspring. As part of the unique advertisement that Sumerian physicians would use to promote their um, sort of excellence to their prospective patients. Another example of a Sumerian incantation or prayer that was used for treatment of conditions or diseases is using a facsimile um, in the form of a piece of dough that was shaped like the patient and using incense and water 
um, as they were pouring water on this little dough facsimile, then the disease was supposed to disappear from the patient's body um, as the water trickled down away from the little um, person's dough-like facsimile. Of course, we know today that this probably wouldn't be a very effective course of treatment. But thousands of years ago, perhaps with the power of suggestion um, or any other additional treatment that might have been used, perhaps this was somewhat successful in getting folks to feel better.